Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal. It is Thursday. We are now just two days away from Arsenal versus Aston Villa in the Premier League. What a huge game that is going to be. Anyone who watched Manchester City versus Aston Villa last night will know just how difficult that is going to be on Saturday. An absolute demolition job by Villa on Man City yesterday. Yes, it was only 1-0. But if you've seen the stats from this, this game, and we'll be talking about it a little bit later on in the show, this was a demolition the like of Manchester City have never really seen under Pep Guardiola in the Premier League. 22 shots they faced and only had two themselves. Unbelievable performance from Villa, who are just four points off the top of the table, flying at Villa Park. This is going to be one tricky game on Saturday. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. I'm going to talk about Mikel Arteta and his farcical Yellow card that he picked up against Luton. Got to have my say on that because I genuinely can't actually believe it happened when you look at the footage. Um, uh, Tomiyasu, real blow, his injury as well. It looks like he's going to be out for between four and six weeks now. So we'll discuss that, of course. Got some questions and comments from you guys as well. And apologies, reading the comments yesterday's show, lots of you were talking about sound issues and audio issues um later on in the latter stages of the, of the video i think during the player ratings i did go back and listen to it and yeah i heard them myself so i'm not sure what happened there i have tested out this morning i've done a couple of trial runs for this show gone back listened to them and it sounds fine so i'm hoping this is going to be fine as well uh but if not of course let me know again in the comments below and i'll see if uh try and work out exactly what's going on but fingers crossed Certainly by the tests I've done this morning, the audio has all sounded fine and back to normal. So I don't know what, I think it must have just been some gremlins in the system yesterday. All right, let's start today's show by talking about Mikel Arteta, who of course is not going to be on the touchline Saturday at Villa Park against Aston Villa because of this. If you watch it on YouTube, you can see there Arteta getting booked in the aftermath of Arsenal's winning goal at Kenilworth Road. That was his third booking of the season, which means he has a touchline ban for one game and he'll miss the match at Aston Villa. He'll be there in the stands, he will be allow, uh, allowed to go in the dressing room before the game at half time and after the game, but he's not going to be able to be at the stands dishing out, uh, sorry, in the uh, at the touchline dishing out instructions during the match. Look, whether this ends up making a big, big difference, who knows? I remember the game that he missed against Manchester City a couple of years ago when he had COVID. Arsenal were brilliant that day. They lost, but they were brilliant. It was a fantastic performance. So, you know, whether it makes too much of an impact. I don't know, but it's still an absolute joke, really. I mean, you can see, yes, he's happy. He celebrates. His team have just scored a 97th minute winner, having been trailing with half an hour to go, 3-2. He's seen his team come back, score a 97th minute winner to go five points clear at the top of the Premier League. And he goes a bit mad. He doesn't leg it onto the pitch by a mile. I mean, if you're looking, look at it. The Kenilworth Road is so tight. The um, technical areas are so small. It's very hard not to put your foot over the line and go onto the pitch. You see it all the time with celebration. I mean, think back to the celebration against Bournemouth last season when Maurice Nelson scored that last minute winner and what happened there. No one got booked in that. So, what I mean, it, it is just so pedantic that he manages to get a yellow card and be out of this game. The FA have confirmed Kai Kainak of Football London yesterday retweeted this story, confirmed that the FA have said to him that it was for excessive celebrating. He doesn't go far. He doesn't go into the Luton area and scream in the manager's face or anything like that. You see the footage, unless something has happened, which it doesn't seem like it has there. There is something that the cameras didn't pick up. Like people were talking about him throwing a bottle or something like that, but there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And if you just go by the footage that you can see, he, he goes about 10 yards down the touchline and then comes back and Carlos Cuesta stops him and they go into discussion and they immediately start you know, talking, I imagine, about should we bring on a sub or something like that. Obviously, didn't have time to do that because the full-time whistle went. But to be booked for it, it is just ridiculous. And it must have come from the fourth official. You know, the referee is obviously the guy who dishes out the yellow card, but it must have come from the fourth official. You can see him there um, in the grey coat next to the referee who must have told the referee to, to book him. But it's just farcical. Honestly, the celebration police have been out in force for the last 24 hours. Uh, certainly on social media from rival teams that are having a go at Arsenal for celebrating, which just makes me laugh. It's like if you can't celebrate a goal in football, especially a last minute goal, it doesn't matter where it is or who it's against, then what is the point in football? It's all about emotion. I hate anyone having a go at anyone for celebrating. So I, I love Thomas Frank's comment on it the other day when he was asked about it by a journalist in the press conference after the Arsenal game. And he said, scoring a goal is the hardest thing you can do in football. So if you do score a goal, especially a last minute winner, then you should celebrate. You know, that's what everyone should think. And for a referee to book Mikel Arteta or an official to be told to book Mikel Arteta for just running around a little bit 
and celebrate in a 97th minute. It's just, it's everything that is wrong with football. Honestly, there's so many more things to worry about and to focus on and to make sure you get right and to book a manager for that. And it's very hard not to think about all the conspiracy theories, of course, of what Mikel Arteta's had to say about referees and the PGMOL and how it's not good enough, you know, all the aftermath of the Newcastle game. And then you see something like this happen and you think, has he just got a big target on his back now? Some people will point to what he said after Newcastle and how he acted after Newcastle and say, well, he deserves it. If you're going to come out like that and, you know, say that sort of stuff, then you're obviously going to rile the referees and match officials and they're all going to stand up for each other. And then you could give yourself a bit of a target on the bat. People said that at the time. And that might be the case. And it's very hard not to see something like this and think that is what's happening. Because I can't, I haven't seen another manager book for, for doing what Mikel Arteta did, celebrating that goal. And you see it all the time. You see Robert uh, Deserby after the Nottingham Forest game the other day when the full-time whistle went, went legging it on the pitch, didn't he? Literally the full length of the pitch and started celebrating in front of the away fans. You know, proper Mourinho style against when he did it for Porto. Or more than Mourinho when he did it for Porto, when he went down the touchline when they won it at Old Trafford all those years ago. You know, he legged it on the pitch. I don't think Deserby got booked for that. So Mikel Arteta <laughs> gets booked for running around about 10 yards after he's seen his team. Oh, it's just, honestly, it's mad. I just don't understand it. And it could be costly for Arsenal. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully it's not going to make too much of an impact on a Saturday at Aston Villa. But of course you want Mikel Arteta on the touchline. If you're an Arsenal player, you want Arteta on the touchline. If you're Arteta, you definitely want to be on the touchline because uh, we all know how uh, intense he is and how into it he gets. And so it is, you know, it could end up being a bit of a blow. And, for, for, you know, I could understand if it had a go at a referee, then by all means, then you deserve a booking. If you do something like that, if you run up to the uh, opposition dugout and you start screaming in their face and giving it some, then yes, you deserve a booking. But, to get yellow carded for what Arteta did, honestly, it's just ridiculous to the absolute extreme. But that's my view. Let me know what you guys think, of course, in the comments below. All right, moving on to Tommy Asu now. This is a real shame. Um, Mikel hinted at it after the game against Luton, obviously, on Tuesday, that he would be out for some time. It appears now the word we're getting is it's going to be about four to six weeks. Four is, you know, the best possible case scenario, almost. Um, could well be six. And that's a huge blow. He'd been playing so well. You know, the highest compliment you can give Tommy Asu is the fact that he was really pushing both fullbacks in terms of Zinchenko and White to be the first choice on either of those sides. You know, he was playing so well whenever he played at right back or whenever he came in and played at played at left back. You know, I think he definitely would have started against Villa this weekend. I think he definitely would have started at Anfield in a couple of weeks' time because he was in such good form. He was offering so much. He was really beginning to revel in that inverted role that the fullback plays and was adding a lot in terms of an attacking, um, in terms of the attacking sort of phases in his play. And to pick up another injury, it's just really, really, it's a real shame for Arsenal. It's a big shame for him. You see his Instagram post here, if you're watching this on YouTube, he says, I'm sick of being injured, but I believe this is the opportunity to be much stronger. Fingers crossed it does turn out to be four weeks. I mean, if it is six weeks, he could potentially come back and then immediately go away to the Asia Cup. And then you're not going to see him until mid-February, potentially, in an Arsenal shirt again, which is, you know, a real worry. He's such an important player. He provides so much cover for the defence. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. Myself and James Benj are sitting down for inside Arsenal extra time later on today. And we're going to talk a lot about the defensive issues Arsenal are facing in terms of numbers at the moment, what that could mean for the January transfer window. You know, should they be dipping into the market now? Does a defender need to be a priority more than the midfielder or an attacker? We're going to be talking about all this sort of stuff in Inside Arsenal extra time later. If you want to share your opinion on that and, you know, say what you think Arsenal should be doing in January, do they need to sign a defender now to cover for the injury, injury to Tommy Asu as well as what's going on with Yuri and Timber? Let me know in the comments below. But it's definitely going to be an interesting thing to see what Arsenal do come January now because with Timber out, with Tommy Asu out, they are looking very, very light. And we know the issues that Ben White has had recently and he's been managed. Um thankfully that workload seems to be have has done him well. And Mikel says he's now in really, really good shape. He certainly looks it against Luton, but Arsenal cannot afford for anything to happen to Ben White now with this Tommy Asu injury on top of the year and timber injury. So it is a real, real blow. But first and foremost, it's just a blow for him. You can see how disappointed he looked when he was walking around the pitch. I think deep down he probably knew this isn't the first time he's had an injury like this. Um, <laughs> probably won't be the last time, judging on previous history records. And that is the one sort of drawback when it comes to Tommy Asu. Such a good player, provides so much cover, versatility, but he just 
does pick up these injuries on a regular basis. And that is a real, real shame for him and a shame for Arsenal. OK, we've got to talk about last night now. Arsenal heading to Villa Park this Saturday and what a game this is going to be. Villa were exceptional yesterday against Manchester City, winning 1-0 with that deflected Leon Bailey strike. But I mean, if you look on YouTube, I've got the match stats up here. I'm, I've never seen anything like it when it comes to Pep Guardiola and a Manchester City side. They were absolutely dominated. I mean, they had a little bit of shade more possession, as you would expect. But look at that. Shots, 22 shots for Aston Villa and just two for Manchester City. Seven shots on target for City, uh, for Villa, two on target, six corners, none for City. It's an absolute walloping in everything but the scoreline. And, you know, it's 14 league wins in a row for Aston Villa now. I mean, they are absolutely flying. You know, was speaking after the game and he was asked if they're title contenders are now four points behind Arsenal. They've moved above Manchester City in the table now, four points above Arsenal. And he says, um, uh, he was asked, Guardiola said after the game that he thinks Aston Villa are title contenders. Unai Emery was asked about that. And he said, we are not contenders. There are seven teams who are more contenders. This is day 15, day 16 is against Arsenal. I think it means game there. Um, we must focus. We are happy to be third, but to keep it, it will be very difficult. While we're there, we will try and keep it. He was asked about how he's going to prepare now for Arsenal. He said, firstly, we will rest try and recover the players. We need full energy in Villa Park. We must create a strong atmosphere. They are transmitting us their energy. We'll try and play good football as a team and tactically and individually too. Then trying to impose our game plan, which against City was very difficult, but we did it more or less. We deserve to win. We created chances, avoided having chances against us. Um, the job from the players was a very good job. That was interesting. We said we avoided having chances against us. The big sort of drawback to Unai Emery, certainly during his time at Arsenal, but not just during the time of Arsenal, during his time of a lot of teams, is that his teams give up a lot of scoring opportunities. They're very open. They can be got at. And we've seen that at times, even the, when you go back to Villa's win at Tottenham the other day. Tottenham had so many chances in that game. But they did. it was not like that yesterday against City. The fact that it's limited them to two chances, you know, they seized control of that game. They gave City no space and they caused them so many problems on the counter-attack. They were just going long, getting the ball out wide as quickly as possible to Leon Bailey, um, who caused... City all sorts of problems and it is yeah it is this is going to be one hell of a game for I mean it's the hardest game in the Premier League now right now there's no other game that's as hard as this in the Premier League 14 league wins in a row at Villa Park you know there's no argument against that this is the hardest team the hardest game you can face at the moment and Villa proved that yesterday Unai Emery's doing an amazing job there um you know whether they are genuine title contenders of course he's going to say no if they can continue this sort of form if they can start basically being better away from home then they have to be genuine title contenders because they're so strong at home but in a way they struggle a little bit see they got a very good win at spurs um but if they can sort that out and start picking up points on a regular basis away from home then they have to be seen as genuine title contenders if they can maintain this home form which at the moment shows no sign of slipping up 14 in a row the last team to beat them Arsenal, that 4-2 win last year. I think it was March, wasn't it, last season? That dramatic win when it was 2-2 and then Jorginho scored the goal, although it went down as an Emi Martinez own goal. Um, when Jorginho's shot hit the bar, came back off Martinez and then Martinelli wrapped it up on the breakaway a few minutes later when Martinez had gone forward for a corner. Um, and that was their last time they've lost a game or last time they've dropped any points in a game at Villa Park. And that was a thrilling game that that uh, last year, and I'm sure this year is going to be exactly the same. It's going to be really interesting to see what Arsenal do. The loss of Tommy Asu is definitely crucial in my mind. I watched that game yesterday, how quickly they got the ball out to Leon Bailey and they isolated him against their fullback. They're going to probably do that again, you would imagine, this weekend, whether Diaby comes back in as well, and then you've got Diaby and Bailey playing. You know, it's, they are going to be a real threat. Ollie Watkins, of course, we know is very, very good and he always scores against Arsenal. Um, and so this is going to be a huge test. Really, really. Someone asked me on Twitter yesterday, like, do you think, would you take a draw? Obviously, you want to win. And what a huge statement it'd be if Arsenal could go to Villa Park and win, given the form that they're on and the performances and the results they're picking up at home. It'd be a huge statement for Arsenal. But would I take a draw? I don't think it'd be a bad result. You know, as I said, I want to win. You always want to win. But I wouldn't turn my nose up on a draw at Saturday, I have to say. Um, <laughs> just look at the form, form guide. It has to be seen as a good result if Arsenal get a draw. But... Obviously, you want to go there and you want to win. I mean, you look at the league table there, how it's all shaping up now after 15 games. Spurs still to play, of course, a little bit later on. Um, I think it's West Ham Spurs have got, hasn't it? But Arsenal, two points clear of Liverpool, who won against Sheffield United yesterday 2-0. Uh, then there they are, Villa, 
32 points. They've moved to be one point of Arsenal if Villa win at the weekend. City now six points behind Arsenal. No wins in four in the Premier League for Pep Guardiola's side. Obviously missing a lot of players at the moment, but that is a big, big worry. There was no Rodri again yesterday. He was suspended and once again, take Rodri out that side and they struggle. Results prove that. And um, they really, yeah, they just had no answer to Villa's intensity and quality of play yesterday. Even when you look at the goal difference now throughout that league, it's so, so tight. Everything is so tight. Arsenal on plus 19, Liverpool one ahead on plus 20, Villa on plus 14, City now on the same as Arsenal, plus 19, Newcastle there on plus 18. It's shaping up to be one hell of a Premier League season this season, as I really thought it would be. I've said it before. I think everyone's going to take points off each other. So many strong teams now, especially. It's so hard to go away from home in the Premier League and get a result. It really, really is. And I think we're seeing that this season. And that's why Saturday is going to be such a difficult game. And um, yeah, intrigued to see what Mikel Arteta is going to do. I'm going to do it for tomorrow's show. Well, I'm sure myself and James will talk about it as well. And tomorrow's show, which... Uh, I'm going to have to record today, unfortunately, because tomorrow I'm out playing golf. Uh, so I'm going to have to pre-record tomorrow's show. Um, so I'm going to do that a little bit later on today. And we'll start looking at the decisions Mikel's got to make in terms of his possible team selection. I think he has got some big decisions to make um, for this one, given the way this game potentially could pan out. Right, let's move on to a few of your questions and comments now. A couple of you getting in touch about Tommy Asu. Uh, Neat and Cleats here says, I think Kivior playing will be important with Tommy out for a while. He's going to have to play more now. And versus Luton was a good test. He wasn't horrible, but he got caught in possession a few times. Defensively, I thought he was good. And I love having his size in the back in general. I think he would likely get a shot at right back too, should White get injured. I certainly don't think Cedric would get the nod. Yeah, it'd be interesting if White did pick up an injury, what Mikel would do now with Tommy Asu out. Obviously, the start of the season, we had Thomas Party there. Thomas Party's injured at the moment, so he doesn't come into the equation. Would it be Kivior over Cedric? Potentially so. Um, obviously, then you've got a left-footed player playing at right back, which is never, never ideal. Fingers crossed Arsenal can just manage Ben White perfectly during this run and make sure that nothing happens to him because uh, it would be awful if he did. I thought Kivior, he struggled a little bit, I thought, against Luton with the intensity. I thought Luton really did target the Arsenal fullbacks. That was their kind of point of press. As soon as the fullbacks got the ball, the, the attackers pressed and um, both struggled. I thought White grew into the game, but Kivior certainly struggled more, which is no surprise given, you know, he's very much naturally a left a centre-back rather than a left-back. Um, but he is going to be really important, I think, over the next six weeks with Tommy Asu now out. Tommy Asu usually provides so much versatility. You can play him on either side. That's gone now. So Kivior's going to have to come into the game. I think he's a really good player. I do like Kivior. Almost every time I see him play, he impresses me. I think he's going to be a really, really key player over the next few weeks. Now, uh, here's one from Space. He says, regarding the Tommy Asu and party injury, what annoys me also is they will probably just recover in time to play the Asia Cup and AFCON in January and probably over get played and in, uh, probably get overplayed and injured again. It is a concern, no doubt about it. As I said earlier, if it does stretch to six weeks for Tommy Asu, then he's basically going to come back and go straight to the Asia Cup. Um which, you know, for Arsenal fans, that's going to be a real concern. I'm sure they'd want him to just pull out of that tournament and concentrate on getting fit. But, you know, this is a big, big tournament for Japan and for Tommy Asu, and I'd be very surprised should that happen. Um, just like the World Cup, actually, he went into that World Cup after having having had an injury in Qatar and um, struggled for fitness, didn't play, I think, for the first couple of games and sort of moved into the tournament, got brought into the tournament when the... Uh, as he got fitter and fitter, and this could well be the same case for him again. And yeah, we could end up being February till Tommy Asu, and that's a real str- that's a real worry. And the same goes for Thomas Party, you know, coming back after an injury like this and then going straight out, flying off for the intensity of the Afcon. I think every Arsenal fan will be sitting watching Garner's game, Garner's games, thinking the exact same thing when it comes to his potential breakdown and an- another injury. But there's nothing Arsenal can do as soon as they get called up by their countries. That's it. It's out of Arsenal's hands. There's nothing they can do. So you just got to sit back with your fingers crossed and hope they can come through it unscathed. Uh, just on a couple of questions here, where there's lots of you getting in touch about Ramsdale and Rye yesterday, and most of you having a go at me saying it's an agenda against Rye, which is absolutely not. Look, I think David Rye is a better goalkeeper than Aaron Ramsdale. I've said it since he arrived. I think he's a better goalkeeper. I don't think we've seen him at his best by any means yet. And, that, and I'm, I'm not sure we will while Ramsdale's still at the club because of just the whole situation and the pressures that it's created. Um, 
Uh, and there's a couple here. Hells Fox here says, I have to say, Charles, I think when it comes to Ryan Ramsdale, about 5% of the drama is from Arteta acquiring and starting a new keeper. And the rest is media hyping it, creating a drama, constantly talking about it and questioning the players and managers to the point that it has impacted the keepers themselves. I just think Arteta is well within his right to snap up a quality keeper. He's wanted an opportune moment before he goes to a different club and start him. Even if he was replacing a promising English keeper, I just think the media constantly badgering and pushing the idea has been way over the top the way they deal with Arteta in general. Yeah, look, I can understand it. And I have said that I do think that this is a bigger story because Ramsdale's English. And so over here, obviously, he's part of the England squad. He was really pushing Jordan Pickford for the number one spot. I mean, just as the signing happened and Rye came in, Ramsdale had started the win for England against Scotland. And so there is obviously more of a, it is more of a talking point because it's exactly the same situation as what happened when Ramsdale replaced Leno. And clearly there was nowhere near as much spotlight on that. Um, because he was replacing Leno. And I just do think the fact that Ramsdale's English is a big part of it. But I also think Ramsdale came in and was exceptional when he replaced Leno. That sort of first 10 games when he came into the side, the difference he made, the saves he was making, the really good games he was having, you know, there was immediately no one was questioning the decision because he played well. Obviously, Raya has struggled a little bit since he's come in. He's had some really good games. I think the last two games building up to the Luton match, I thought Raya was excellent and looked really, really tidy. But there have been errors that have been very, you know, high profile ones that has sort of added to this debate. And I think it's just going to happen. You're going to have this level of scrutiny at a club like Arsenal if you make a big decision like this. So I don't think it's necessarily just, it's, you know, it's not a media driven thing. I think it's just the nature of the beast. It's football and it's what we talk about. It's all opinion based and there's so much coverage of it now. So yeah, I don't think it's, it's some big agenda being pushed by the media over here. I just think it is as I said, the nature of the football beast and the spotlight that the game is under. And especially if you're playing for a club like Arsenal and a big decision has been made like this, um, that you're going to, it's going to create headlines. It's just always going to happen. Uh, Stephen says, deep down, Arsenal fans know who is the better keeper for the way we play, but the agendas won't allow us to admit. The good thing is Arteta's decisions have always been proved right in the long run. I.e., sticking with Xhaka when most fans wanted him out, cutting out Orba even after fans moaned and recently sticking with King Kai. Now we are singing his name. Rye will come good. I, I look, Stephen. I, I do think, and it's not even deep down. I've said it before. I do think Raya is a better goalkeeper than Aaron Ramsdale. Um. So, but and there is no agenda. There's absolutely no agenda from me on this. I think Raya is a better goalkeeper than Aaron Ramsdale, but I just don't think we've seen Raya at his best yet, and he has made some big errors. But it happens, of course, it does. We watched Manchester City, watched City versus Liverpool recently. Edison made huge errors in that game it's just it happens when you're a goalkeeper but you know that's not going to stop the spotlight being put on this and it's going to continue until probably the end of the season when one of the goalkeepers leaves who you think would be Aaron Ramsdale and until then it's just as frustrating as it might be that we're going to talk about it and that I'll bring it up and that other people will talk about it and that the TV cameras will continually show Aaron Ramsdale on the bench whenever David Ryan makes a mistake it's just going to happen because it is a story and that's the way football works, uh, unfortunately. But hopefully, fingers crossed, David Royal will have a fantastic game at Aston Villa. He's definitely going to be put under pressure, no doubt about that. I think Villa are going to target him. I watched what they did with their set pieces yesterday against Manchester City and how congested it was in the penalty area. You know, they will they will swing balls in right under the crossbar um, to try and test out David Raya and that Arsenal defence, especially after what they saw against Luton at the at the weekend. So Raya's going to have to be mentally strong. He's going to have to be physically strong, and he's going to have to prove everyone why Arteta has this amount of trust in him. All right, everyone, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching and listening. As always, like I said, I'll be back later on today with myself and James Bench sit down for Inside Arsenal Extra Time. So anything you want us to talk about or debate, any questions you've got, do let me know in the comments below. Start it with Extra Time and then let me know exactly what it is. Have a great day, everyone. I'll speak to you soon.